The Tolkien Road, Episode 104, The Lord of the Rings, of Herbs and Stewed Rabbit. Hey there, fellow travelers. Welcome to the Tolkien Road, a long walk through Middle-earth. On this episode, we continue our journey through The Lord of the Rings with Book 4, Chapter 4 of Herbs and Stewed Rabbit. Before we get started, why not hop on over to iTunes and leave The Tolkien Road a rating and feedback. It's a great way to show your support for the show and takes less than a minute. Or you can stop by TolkienRoad.com, learn about previous episodes, and say hey. We're also on Facebook at Facebook.com slash Tolkien Road, as well as Twitter at at Tolkien Road. Thanks for listening, and enjoy. Hello everyone, welcome to the Tolkien Road, book four, chapter four of the Lord of the, Lord of the Rings. Yep. Of uh, Herbs and Stewed Rabbit. Herbs and Stewed Rabbit. That sounds delicious. Uh, have you ever had Stewed Rabbit before? Um, have you ever eaten rabbit before? Let me I just don't that. think I have, but I've heard that it tastes like chicken. Mm. I'm not surprised by that. Yeah. I don't think it's a very gamey. Like, as far as wild game goes, I think mm-hmm. it's one of the less gamey animals. Mm. Especially young rabbit. But that's just what I've heard. Cool. I think it does need a lot of cooking time, though. I think there's a reason Sam stewed it instead of frying it, because I think mm-hmm. it tends to be kind of muscular Yeah. and tough. Mm-hmm. So, more time on the heat, the better. Mm. Yeah. Right on. Yeah. Um... So, I know you've had herbs before, so I won't bother asking you about that. I've had lots of herbs. Lots of herbs. Some legal, some not. No, just kidding. Ooh. <laughs> 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 totally kidding. No idea what that means. Uh, hey, <laughs> special thanks to our executive producer, William Hutton, as well as our other generous patrons. You can learn more about signing up to become a Patreon over at TolkienRoad.com or Patreon.com slash TolkienRoad. And you can be one of the awesome people who contributes to keeping this podcast going. One of the super awesome. That's right. Uh, and speaking of those people, we need to do um, we need to do a uh, drawing for our, oh, our yeah. Patreon. Oh, yeah. It's been a while, so, has it not? Well, actually, we kind of did the one in March late because we... we you know, we started off, we, we took a long break, and then we kind of started back in late in March. Oh, right. Um. So, we're going to go ahead and do our drawing. So, um, the three previous winners are uh, excluded for the time being. Um, and let's see here. Let's get it all queued up. So, I've got my list there. All right, we're going to let Siri pick, as always. Hey, Siri, pick a random number between one and eight. Number six. That means one, two, three, four, five, six. Caleb Santana. Caleb, you Caleb, are you're our winner. the winner. Congratulations Woo! to you, sir. Uh, I will be reaching out to you and letting you know your choice. It usually comes down to one of three uh, books. I think the last couple of folks have chosen the Tolkien Reader. Um, but uh, I will be reaching out to you and uh, you seeing what your choice is. But you can choose whatever you want. Within Within you know, what? I'm just saying he doesn't he, he have can't to choose... Cho- he can't choose a new car. No. I meant he yeah. doesn't have to choose a Tolkien reader. Right. That's what I meant. Okay, good. He can choose whatever he wants from your selection. He okay. doesn't have to feel like he has to choose the same thing that everybody else has chosen. I'm glad we're clear on that. That's all I was trying to say. Well... I'm just trying to encourage people to be free to be themselves. hmm To be individuals. You, you need to ask no pardon for that. Okay. Yeah. Well, good. I'm glad. You're kind of making me feel like I do. Okay. All right. Well... But I don't... Okay. All right, so we're good. We're good. Moving on. Good why, job, Caleb. Why are we Caleb? arguing about this? All right. Good job, Caleb. Uh, yeah, so enter, uh, go sign up over at patreon.com slash Tolkien Road if you want to be entered in next month's drawing. Do or it. if you just want to see some of the awesome videos we've got to post it over there. Mm-hmm. Or if you just want the inner satisfaction of knowing that you're contributing to the greatest podcast of all time. Whoa, yeah. Yeah. So. Not like we're giving ourselves airs or anything. 
Well, no, I've just heard other people say that about right. us. Right. Oh, yeah, yeah. No, I know. We're just repeating what yeah. people... I'm, yeah. I'm pretty sure other people say about us all the time. I have no doubt. Yeah. Yeah. I would never say such a thing because humility is the... I, I'm just... I'm incredibly humble. Yes, I know. Yeah. I know you are. Amazingly humble. <laughs> Aren't we all? Yes. Don't we all strive to be? Uh, well, I strive to be more than everyone else. So. Okay. Yeah. Well, I'm glad that we have that settled now as well. Me too. All right. So can we move on? Oh, yeah. So, um, uh, hey, um, what was I going to do? I had something else to say. Oh, you know what I wanted to do? What? Uh, Sometimes, every once in a while, we go over to our iTunes page, because we're always asking people to go rate us over on iTunes, and we go over to our iTunes page and we say, hey, hey, uh, who said something nice about us over on iTunes lately? And because that's like, you know, lots of people download, most people download from a podcast from iTunes. So, you know, it's a great way to, you know, other people start finding out about it and they see all the people saying nice things about us and they're like, oh, I think I want to listen to this podcast. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's what they say. So we're going to, we had, we've had some people comment since the last time we took a look. Oh, cool. Um, Yeah. In fact, I think we might have like six new people, six new ratings. Um, Oh. Yeah, almost all of them five stars. Um, so the first is from, let's see, Josh Jasowitz. I think I'm saying that name right, from February 13th. He says, awesome podcast. Thank you. You guys do a great job of diving deep into the world of to- Tolkien. I've read many of Tolkien's works, and one of the most challenging to really get a grasp on is the Silmarillion. I've been listening to the podcast every morning on my way to work, and it's the best part of my day. Whoa. Thank you for shedding some light on some great areas that I have when reading uh, also the 90 humor, 90s humor is much appreciated so That's awesome great thanks Josh thanks for your awesome comment Josh yeah, we really appreciate it totally um, let's see guitar guy 590 said love it I love this podcast Tolkien would be oh so proud the Carswells crush it whoa man thank man. you man awesome like a huge ego boost That's right. session That's right. here mm-hmm. yeah. well there's more oh yeah Hey, I don't know if I can take it. Yeah, well, it's like my head's about to explode. Yeah, strap yourself, strap yourself in. Right <laughs> here it comes. I really enjoy the enthusiasm for, uh, by Frederick uh, Umverzagt, uh, who's also written into us a couple of times. Oh, he okay. says, "I really enjoy the enthusiasm for Tolkien's work and the spot-on appreciation of its merits." Uh, I was a little disappointed that you jumped around, as I assumed before reading in order. Obviously, that you didn't cover them in chronological order. Uh, it seems to me you did so for Greta's benefit. I'm not sure what he's referring to there, but maybe... Uh, that oh, maybe that we started with the, the Silmarillion, Hob- maybe first? Isn't that technique... Uh, that would be chronological. Maybe he means we can do The Hobbit yet? Maybe. Oh, I think I think he's referring to us going to The Lord of the Rings before we finish The Silmarillion, maybe. Oh, did we do that? Yeah. Oh. We kind of got halfway through The Silmarillion, and then we jumped around. That's... Yeah. Right. We just couldn't wait to get to the Lord of the Rings. Like, you know, Lord of the Rings is my favorite book of and all let's time. let's be honest, so. I was threatening to quit if we kept doing the Silmarillion. Well. Without a I break. You enjoy- yeah, we- I guess you needed a break. I needed it's a challenging. break. challenging. He's right. It was totally for my benefit. Right on. So he yeah. finishes and he says, uh, so I find a few things quite distracting from the story, but they're small things when compared to my appreciation for your affection, respect, and attempt to understand the material. I've reread these stories a thousand times, and I have a lot of differences with regards to my interpretation of his incredible masterpiece. Uh, the Silmarillion is by far the best of the bunch, in my humble opinion, and I'm actually at a loss as to why it seems to be a thing that it's somehow difficult to understand. But it's not just uh, it's not just a thing with your podcast. There's several devoted to a similar approach. Anyhow, thanks for all your dedication and hard work. So, Frederick, I will tell you, Frederick is from... Uh, oh, well, my other... Uh, recorder went off, so we'll have to make sure this one. Hopefully, this one works. Oh, that's weird. Need to. Good thing you have a backup. It's a good thing I got an extra. <laughs> that's right. Um, so, let me just double check and make sure. Yeah, we got enough battery in that one. That's why we do too. Mm-hmm. In case something like that happens. Yeah. Um, so I will tell you that uh, from my court, my other correspondence with with Frederick. Mm-hmm. Um, man, this guy loves Tolkien. Like, you know, this guy... He sounds very well-versed. Yeah, and this guy uh, is a, a huge Tolkien aficionado. And for the group, I mean, for people who are really passionate about Tolkien, uh, they are like they tend to be a very uh, opinionated bunch, mm. right? So, uh, you know, I'm just appreciative that we got such a great 
you know, uh, appreciative comment from Frederick, you know, like. So he has high standards. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. He's got some high standards when it comes to cool. Tolkien. Cool. So, thanks for, I'll thanks for the it. awesome note, Frederick. Yes, really appreciate thank it. Thank you, Frederick. Um, and let's see, uh, Benny Burr said on March 14th, he said, very insightful. This is a very enjoyable podcast. There is a great perspective from a sincere Tolkien buff and someone new to his works. Thanks. Thank nice. you. Thank you, Benny Burr. Yes. Thank you. Uh, uh, Caligati says, great show, guys. You answer the same kind of questions I have. Nice cast. Ooh, thank you. Thank sweet. you. Thank you. And uh, my name is Taken uh, says, this is awesome. Uh, from March 31st. This is a great mixture of insight into Tolkien and entertaining exchanges between John and Greta. Highly recommended to anyone who wants to learn about Tolkien in a more fun, i.e. less academic environment. Yes. That's what we're shooting for. That's exactly what we're shooting for. That's what we're shooting for. Um, We don't call ourselves the Wayne and Garth of Tolkien for nothing. That's right. Yeah. The the Wayne's World of Tolkien podcast. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. That's what we are. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay. So, we're caught up on iTunes reviews. Can I just say real quick how much I love that that name, My Name is Taken? Yeah. That's awesome. That's like, I want that to be my email address. My Name is Taken at gmail.com. That would be ironic if that was your email address. It would be ironic. Yeah. Which makes it funny. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, anyway. Okay. Thank you to I, everybody. The irony, the irony blew my mind there. I was thinking about it, so it just <laughs> made me had to... Um, thank you guys for all the awesome reviews. That's right what... On. It helps us get more, like, exposure, right? Isn't that how it works? When you get more reviews, you get... Like, yeah, you know... It's easier I, to find you. That's on... what they say. That's what they say. Okay. Um, I just... I just love, I just love hearing from people and well, I do you know, too. New people reaching out, so yeah, yeah, it's a win-win. Mm-hmm. Yeah. All right, um, secret word stuff from last time. Yes. Yeah, so our secret word last week was. Can I get a drum roll? Roses. Roses. That's right. And Mary Grace was nice. the first one to correctly guess it. Yep. Amanda also guessed it correctly, but she came in second to Mary Grace. All right. So, shout out, super fan Mary Grace. Well done. Uh-huh. Please uh, hit me up with the Gmail account. Let me know what you want our next word to be. Yeah, right on. Yeah. Cool. And uh, Shannon uh, guessed the one before this, so she has chosen today's secret word. Got it. To be on the lookout or the listen out. Cool. Yeah. All right. Okay, let's uh, let's get started on the chapter. All right, I have one note what? that has to do with this chapter. Oh, okay. From Amanda. Mm-hmm. Um, it's funny. I read her note before I had read the chapter or reread the chapter, and I had no idea what she was talking about. But now I get it. Mm-hmm. Anyway, she says, "As for this week's chapter, one thing I enjoyed was seeing that uh, was seeing what I imagine as a namesake of Mablong." The naming of the Gondorian may have nothing to do with Turin's elf warrior friend. However, it made me smile, thinking that maybe he was named in honor of the great elf of Doriath. Yeah. Well, I, I, Can I you just explain that. I just well, so uh, Mablong, who is one of the Gondorian warriors in this week's chapter, right? Right. Yeah, I know who Mablong is. I yeah. didn't understand the possible namesake. So, aspect of it. Uh, let me grab my copy of the Silmarillion here, but. He, he Mablong is a um, is an elf is an elf in pretty sure he's an elf and uh, yeah she calls him Torin's elf Ryan. warrior friend <laughs> right oh of Torin Tornbar yeah oh okay yeah I didn't remember that um well there's a lot of names there's a lot of names in the Silmarillion to remember that's so true. that's not surprising but uh, yeah Mablong elf of Doriath chief captain of Thingol friend of Torin uh, called of the heavy hand which is the meaning of the name Mablong. Uh, slain in Minagroth by the dwarves. So, um, Mablong was a friend of Torn Torinbar and apparently a great elvish warrior. Okay. Uh, one of the Sindarin elves. And, um, so yeah, and I think, I think we're going to find other characters in the Lord of the Rings that are named after characters from the Silmarillion. So another cool thing about, if you know the Silmarillion, yep. you know, to know when you're reading the Lord of the Rings. Insight. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, yeah, these are all you know. These are all famous, na- famous people for them, right? Yep. For these characters of the Third Age, these are the men of renown, the elves of renown of of yore, right? And so, Got it. It makes sense that people would name their kids after them. 
right? Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Kind of like how people name their kids uh, after saints and people they respect and things like that. Even today. That's right. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. Um, okay. So, all right. Any other notes on the chapter before we... I uh, know. That was the only one. Okay. So, um, so they've decided, Frodo and Sam and Gollum, uh, Frodo and Sam have decided to follow Gollum uh, down along the western edge of uh, the mountains of Mordor, right? So they're following through into the land of Ithilien. Okay. Right? So Ithilien is this land, and, and apparently Gollum knows, a, knows kind of a secret passage up to uh, through the mountains of the west, okay. right? So uh, they're following Gollum, trusting that he's going to lead them you know, right. lead them on the right path. Yep. Um, and what this, the, especially the first part of this chapter, has a lot of description of landscape. Mm-hmm. Right. It's like every once in a while, Tolkien just has to devote like a couple of pages to describing landscapes. It's like he has to like get his fix or get it out of his system or something. Yeah. Yeah. You know, he, he's he's got a, um, uh, you know, he's he's just this guy who love. You know, I kind of think he, Tolkien might have been. If he hadn't been a writer, he might have wanted to become a painter of landscapes or something like that, mm. just because he seems to really relish the opportunity to describe things, you know. And it's and it's clear that he's the kind of guy that spent a lot of time out in nature because he knows the things he knows the names for so many different things that mm. I don't know the name yes. for. Right. I even had to look up like Dell, you know, like what is a Dell? Because oh. I know like the farmer in the Dell. Yes, you know? yes, yes. So I had to look that up to find out actually what it Dingle. is. Yeah, we last a long time ago. We had to look up Dingle. Yeah, those Dern Dingles. Yeah. Um, and, uh, but there's so many different ways, descriptions he uses. Um, we'll just give it one, a uh, couple of examples here. Um, the glowing, the growing light revealed to them a land already less barren and ruinous. The mountains still loomed up ominously on their left, but near at hand, they could see the southward road now bearing away from the black roots of the hills and slanting, uh, westwards. Beyond it were slopes covered with somber trees like dark clouds, but all about them lay a, a tumbled heath, heathland, grown with ling and broom and cornel and other shrubs that they did not know. I, I don't know what ling and broom and cornel are, but... They flowers, maybe? Um, they must be. Or bushes or shrubs. Um, it's almost like a horticulturist guide, you know? It kind of is, yeah. Here and there they saw knots of tall pine, pine trees... The hearts of the hobbits rose again a little in spite of weariness. The air was fresh and fragrant, and it reminded them of the uplands of the North Farthing far away. It seemed good to be reprieved to walk in a land that had only been for a few years under the dominion of the Dark Lord, and was not yet fallen wholly into decay. But they did not forget their danger, nor the black gate that was still all too near, hidden though it was behind the gloomy heights. They looked about for a hiding place where they could shelter from evil eyes while the light lasted. So, here they are, uh, and they're starting to enter into a land that, from that description, sounds to me a little more pleasant than what they've been yeah. going through, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. They, they leave the fellowship further up, uh, further north, they enter into the Amon Will, and it's this rocky, uh, you know, kind of rocky place where they get lost, and, you know, it's, it's a pretty dismal place, and out of that they go into the swamps, right, into the marshes. And then they enter into the area right right outside the the Black Gate, and it's like this ashen, barren place. Yes. And it's like a war landscape. Right. Yeah. And now here they are, entering and into a place that's a little more growing. A little more like a place that you'd think a hobbit would be comfortable. Right. 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 Yeah. There's things. There's plants growing. Wild. You know, uh, plenty plenty of types of just wild plants growing. Forests, trees. All these kinds of beautiful mm-hmm. things. So, mm-hmm. you know. Which means that there's then obviously more light and the soil is richer, which right. means there's probably a water source not far. And yeah, things are definitely looking up. And they're in this, and they're in this area. So if you look at your map, you know, they're right here between. Mm-hmm. Um, so this, you know, this, this area right here with all the. Uh, the squiggly lines right. of the mountains, mm-hmm. the, the, the western wall of Mordor. Mm-hmm. 
and they've come from down here, and so they're entering into this North Ithilien land right here between the the Great River and this wall. And it yeah. and it looks really tiny actually on the map, but it's actually twenty like twenty miles, like twenty miles wide. Yeah. So it's it's pretty wide, right? This is a pretty large area there. Mm -hmm. Anyway, Indeed. um, so lots lots more descriptions of landscapes. I'm not gonna you know try to go through and and read every single one of them, um, but. Uh, one thing I did want to discuss was the eye, you know, oh, the eye. Oh, yeah. So, you know, we've heard about the eye and this being like a symbol of, uh, Sauron's forces. Like, it's almost like, it's almost like it's Sauron's brand, you know? <laughs> yes. You know? Yeah. Um, it's like his version of the swoosh. Yeah. So he says, it, it says, um. They had not come very far from the road, and yet even in so short a space they had seen scars of the old wars and the newer wounds made by the orcs and other foul servants of the Dark Lord, a pit of uncovered filth and refuse, trees hewn down wantonly and left to die with evil runes or the fell sign of the eye cut in rude strokes on their bark. So, you know, what do you think, why do you think this is the emblem of Sauron, this eye? The eye? Yeah. I mean, what do you think the symbol, like, what do you think the symbolism of it is, I guess? Uh, it's red, right? Yeah. It's the red eye. Yeah, and so remember, you, if you go back to book three, mm -hmm. you remember hearing about the some of the orcs had, you know, the mark of the red right. eye. Some of them some had of the, the white hand, hand, which was the mark of Sa of Saruman. Right. Right. The red um, eye is the mark of Sauron. Right. So yeah. yeah, what what gives? What do you think gives with that? Well, at least the first thing that pops into my brain is like the whole idea of constantly being watched. Mm -hmm. Right. It's it's like always under surveillance there's nowhere that i don't see you it's almost like a like an omnipresent mm -hmm. omnis you know like a yeah just there's you can't do anything that i'm not going to know about um and i think that um, that's very that's a very unsettling idea yeah i mean for a more christ-like or god figure that's a comforting idea mm -hmm. right but for somebody so evil it's a very unsettling idea, knowing that they're always watching you and there's nowhere to hide yeah. from their evil gaze. Uh -huh. So that's the first thing that pops into my brain. No, I would definitely agree with I would, I would agree with your assessment. Um, I mean, it's almost got that Big Brotherish sort of fear mm -hmm. to you know feel to it, right? You know, yeah. Big Brother is always watching. Sauron is always watching, mm -hmm. right? Um, mm -hmm. uh, it's this. It's this like uh, you're always under surveillance kind yeah. of deal yeah. and. Uh, but but also, so like you're always looking over your shoulder. Right? It also strikes me that like, um, you know, the idea that like it's it's all the eye is always open, watching you, and it never rests, right? Mm -hmm. And um, never closes, never blinks. And and that would be a um, you know that would be an exhausting an exhausting thing, right? So I think you never close your eyes. Yeah, yep, right? For agree. for the person never closing their eyes. Yep. Um, so, but it's also like, you know, you call out like omniscient and uh, and that kind of thing. You know, it's, uh, it's, it's indicative of somebody trying to set themselves up as a god, right? Yeah. Or, or god, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, yeah, so it's this, yeah. it's this um, idea that like, uh, there's no escaping my mm -hmm. you know my power my watch my watchful gaze yeah. uh, anywhere you go and so um you know it, it's it's a it's an entry i don't know i just i wanted to highlight that symbol because it comes up more than a more than once and just to say like you know this is something to keep in mind as we think more about what mm -hmm. sauron is and how he works right right it, it'll be it'll be interesting to us because you know, you think about Sauron, and he's this, like, very spooky figure. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, he's obviously a supernatural being. Um, and, you know, he's he's a, you know, he was a Maiar, right? And a very powerful Maiar mm -hmm. at that. He learned all of his tricks from Melkor. Right. But it'll be interesting to see how he, op like, how he operates uh, as we get further into the story. Um, especially when we get to, like, um, book five mm -hmm. and seeing the way that like some of his lieutenants negotiate try, like try to negotiate and kind of 
negotiate for a peace treaty. Um, you'd think that like being like wanting to be this all powerful, like evil, like almost like demonic force, they wouldn't want to do that. But like, it's almost like they, they start politically bargaining at some point, you know, like political negotiations at some point, you know? Hmm. And, um, it's just interesting to think about that dynamic when you're used to thinking about this being like a supernatural kind of like spooky thing, yeah. you know? Yeah. And there, I think there is that part of it, but there's also, there's also kind of the like trying to, trying to be like a political force as well. Hmm. So I think I, what, I guess the reason I'm highlighting that is that I think Tolkien does such a good job because you look back at, um, you look back at like the, the totalitarian, uh, regimes of the early 20th century. And on one hand, you have like the fascists, like the Nazis and, um, and the fascists of Italy. Um, and on the other hand, you have the communists of Russia and both of them, even though they were like opposite ends of the political spectrum, they were both trying to accomplish kind of a very similar thing, kind of like an all pervasive Mm -hmm. control of the lives of individuals. Yes. Right. Um, almost like a godlike presence within, within the lives of these, of these different people. And on one hand, there was a very kind of strong, like there's a very strong, like spiritual dimension to Mm -hmm. what they were trying to do, Mm -hmm. you know, a very like deep evil. But on the other hand, they were good at like presenting themselves in a very like politically acceptable way for a long time, you know, gotcha. um, political, political maneuvering, political bargaining. They were political entities, you know, and sometimes we can think of like, you know, the devil and all of his forces being just purely, um, like, like this kind of spiritual heebie-jeebies kind of mm. like thing, you know, yeah. like ghosts, yeah. boo, right, kind of stuff, <laughs> um, like exorcist kind of stuff, you know. Yes, yeah. And, and I think there is some truth to that, but I think there's also, I think there's also this dimension of setting yourself up as in, in a political terms as a force that's, um, you know, trying to have this like godlike presence in people's lives, hmm. and um, you know, trying to set yourself up as a god. Okay. Over other people. Okay. So anyway. Interesting. Anyway, I I I just wanted to talk about the red eye and highlight that, um, you know, of Sauron's brand. Yeah. Right. Because I think it's neat that he has a brand. <laughs> well, Saruman does too. I I could I could see that if Sauron, you know, like if 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 this was happening today, that like Sauron would be like you know Sauron Incorporated. And it would be like, <laughs> you know. Be like the red eye on everything. Like you know, go buy your go buy your uh, potato chips, and you got the red eye yeah, on the it. Red you know? eye on it, yeah. Like fast, you know the red eye, like red eye restaurants. You know. Yeah, it's, well, it's kind of it also kind of begs the question too. You talked about Sauron's thing is the red eye, whereas Saruman's is the white hand, right? Yeah. So they each have a brand. Both of them are body parts, but with very different functions. Right. Well, and to get a little. To, to get a little biblical on this, um, the book's called The Two Towers. Mm-hmm. We've talked a lot about, we talked a lot in the last few episodes about the significance of towers right. in the books. But what's, you know, what's the most famous tower in in sacred scripture? It's the Tower of Babel. Right. Right. Yep. And what was the Tower of Babel? Well, it was basically all these human beings getting together and trying to create a tower that would rise up to heaven. Mm-hmm. Right. Mm-hmm. And, um... And basically, like, ascend under their own power. Almost make of themselves gods. God. yeah. Right? Mm-hmm. And, um, and, 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 and as I see it, that's what both Sauron and Saruman are trying to do. Right? Yeah. Absolutely. Um, and Tolkien talks about how that's, you know, that's one of the themes of his work. Is, you know, the, the corrupting power, the corrupting nature of power. Right? You yes. Know, that it makes you want to reach too far to to be too powerful indeed drags you in all right so that's the eye which is the whole reason we're reading this story in the first place that's right because that's what the ring does Mm -hmm. right it works on that desire for power Mm -hmm. to have ultimate control preach it yeah yeah i will um so let's see here so uh you know lot lots of landscapes um, I, I wanted also to talk about um, this little bit about Sam's view of Frodo, um, the way he looks at him here, kind of when he's sleeping. So Gollum, uh, Frodo goes to sleep. Gollum's nowhere to be found. Um, and 
Sam just kind of looks at him while he's sleeping and says, uh, and it says he was reminded suddenly of Frodo as he had lain asleep in the house of Elrond after his deadly wound. Then, as he had kept watch, Sam had noticed that at times a light seemed to be shining faintly within, but now the light was even clearer and stronger. Frodo's face was peaceful. The marks of fear and care had left it. But it looked old, old and beautiful, as if the chiseling of the shaping years was now revealed in many fine lines that had before been hidden, though the identity of the face was not changed. Not that Sam Gamgee put it that way to himself. He shook his head, as if finding words useless, and murmured, I love him. He's like that, and sometimes it shines through, somehow. But I love him, whether or no. Um, so, I just, I liked this little glimpse of yeah. of Sam's, uh, you know, just intense devotion and love for Frodo, right? Yeah. Uh, you know, this, this growing, this growing love of friendship. We had a, we had a discussion about, in one of my, the classes that I teach this past, past few weeks, we read a poem by this guy named, uh, E.E. E. Cummings. And, um, he was one of my favorite poets and perhaps his most famous poet is called, uh, since feeling is first. And we had this little debate about like what, and the poem is kind of about like, um, you know, feelings and, and love, like, and love and, Mm -hmm. uh, you know, and so we got into this debate about like, what is love? Like, um, what is, what is the true nature of love? Uh, what is love in its truest form? And you know, there's different there's different forms of love, mm-hmm. right? You know, C.S. Lewis wrote about the four loves in a book called The Four Loves, right? And yes. you know, two of them, uh, you know, two of them that spring very clearly to mind. Um, the the kind of the the biggest one being agape, right? Which is the love of God, right? Mm-hmm. The, the kind of God is love, the love of God poured into our hearts, right? right. Um, love for God, love for things, and uh, in the proper order in which they they kind of merit that love, right? Right. Um, and God being the most the most supreme good, right? He, you know, is in, in that order is deserving of the most love, and then other human beings, right, are deserving of love because right. being made in the image of mm-hmm. God, right? Mm-hmm. Kind of next in that in that order of things. And we talked about, <clears throat> excuse me, we talked about love as more about action than about feeling right or mm-hmm. or actually you know the kind of the old baltimore catechism definition do you remember what it is from doing it with the kids i don't uh love is willing the good of another is what it oh, is that's right? right which is so in and the kids in my class were great because they we had a good discussion about like how if, when you base your love for things all on how you feel about them in the present moment uh th- those things can be fleeting and can right. be deceptive that's right right yeah um but and not to say that feelings are bad. Feelings are just that. They're feelings. Right. But true love is willing the good of another. Mm-hmm. Right? Is seeking the good of another. Is um, adoring something in its proper order of being adored. Right? Yeah. yeah. And um, so I love. I like this passage of Sam just kind of looking at Frodo because they've been through so much so far. And Sam is all about his duty. And I and I talked to the kids and I was like, you know, so you know what's a what's a word we could use to describe that love, like the Baltimore Catechism, love, right? The willing a good of another. You know, what's what's another four letter word we could use to describe that kind of love? And they all kind of they all kind of scratched their heads. And I said, here's a word that you're never going to hear anybody in our day and age say to describe love. Love is duty. Duty. Right. I thought that's what you were going to say. Right. Mm-hmm. It's it's what you owe it's what you have it's what you have due to others mm-hmm. right okay that's what true love is and when i look at when i look at this and and sam's like sam to me is just all about his duty right mm-hmm. like that is what i feel like makes him such a compelling character is he is just like frodo uh, i serve frodo right i'm there with him through thick and thin he right. he goes scrambling after him when frodo tries to get away and won't let him go unless he Unless Frodo lets him come along, right? Right. Yep. And and it's beautiful. But then you see this just the way he glimpses him here, and and you know the feeling now corresponds to the, the true love, yeah. right? Mm-hmm. I love him. He's like that, and sometimes it shines through somehow. But I love him, whether or no. Right. So that's interesting. So do you think? I mean, I know that that Sam has 
you know, I mean, I don't think Sam would have re- agreed to go on this journey with Frodo if he didn't love him to start with. But when you continue to fulfill that duty, mm-hmm. make good on those promises that you've made, that's what causes that love to grow mm-hmm. even greater. Yeah. And I think that's why he's seeing Sam the way he I mean, why he's seeing Frodo the way he is right now. Yeah. Because he's he's been in his service and he's been, you know, fulfilling his duty day after day after day in some really horrible circumstances. Mm-hmm. And they've he's refused to give up and now it's that's almost that's like a it's it's like it's a grace, right? Mm-hmm. That he's getting to continue to fuel him on right. for what's ahead. Exactly. Exactly. You know that I mean you nailed it, right? It's I feel I feel like it's kind of a virtuous cycle. It is a virtuous right? cycle, yeah. Um, you know, you, you you continue to do the things that are your duty, right? Mm-hmm. And as you do them, you your will to do them becomes stronger and stronger. Mm-hmm. Right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, you might go through times when it's when it actually is harder. Because you're pushing to some new level of love. Right. Right? Yeah. But you continue to do them no matter what. Yeah. Right? And you're rewarded um, for that. Right. You know, and, and, and you kind of juxtapose that with what is the popular notion of love. And you realize just they're, they're, they're almost polar, they're almost polar yeah. opposites, right? Well, I don't have feelings for you anymore. Mm-hmm. Well, that doesn't matter. Right. What's your duty? Right? right. Do your duty and those feelings might return. Yeah. They probably will return. Yeah. Yeah. It, it might not be on your timetable. Right. But but guess what? You get down the road and you, you've done the thing you're supposed to do, you're going to be glad you did it. Mm-hmm. Right? Absolutely. It may not even be in this life that you're glad you did it. It might be, you know, it might be when you get to heaven and receive your reward, but you will receive that reward of love. Right. Right? Yeah. Of, of true love. Mm-hmm. Uh, because love is the only thing that lasts. Um, Indeed. So, anyway, I, I, this is just such yeah. a... Such a beautiful little passage. Yeah, it right is. Here. It's absolutely beautiful, and it was, it was kind of surprising to me because it's not how I expected. I mean, I don't. I think if somebody else had looked at Frodo, they wouldn't have seen what Sam saw. Mm-hmm. You think of what they've been through, right? How exhausted he is, the toll that this journey has taken on him so far. I was really surprised when he started talking about the light. That seemed to be fading. That seemed to be shining faintly within. That was became clearer and stronger. Mm-hmm. His face was peace. That was not what I expected him to say. Mm-hmm. I mean, that that was not that was not what I expected him to see. I thought he, it was he was going to be, um, you know, that he would just look old and haggard. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, so yeah, it's and almost so like Sam was looking at it with the eyes of love. Yeah, you know, so yeah, yeah, and there's almost like this. Um... Uh, I don't have it pulled up right in front of me, but there's a there's a quote from um, Thomas Merton where he talks about after he had been kind of like he had, he had gone into hermit mode, like complete hermit mode for a while, mm-hmm. and um, and when he came out of it, like he just he felt like you know it was, it was for like weeks or months, and when he came out of it, <clears throat> he just he writes this beautiful passage about like you know how do you explain to people that they're shining like the sun. You know, hmm. and you know the whole point of him going into this hermit mode was to kind of like commune more deeply with God for a while, mm-hmm. and um, and and so seeing God more clearly through that process, he starts to see the beauty in in the images of God, right, and the peop in the people of God, and because they're made in His image, right, yeah, right. You know, whether they be acting like it or not, mm-hmm. he still sees the beauty in them and the goodness in them, right. And it's almost mm-hmm. like that's what you know, Sam is seeing here, but he's seeing it more intensely because Frodo is also doing his duty, right? Right. Frodo right. is also pushing, even when it hurts, even when he doesn't feel like doing it, mm-hmm. he's pushing towards that goal, even when he feels like there's not a lot of hope. Yeah. He's pushing towards it, right? Yep, absolutely. So it's a really beautiful... It is. It's, it's, it really is lovely. One of the, you know, just that it's that heroic quality of the story that I think is one of the most compelling and attractive aspects of Lord of the Rings. Mm-hmm. You know, these characters that just they they're so inspiring in the way they they handle themselves and they carry themselves. They're not perfect, but they they know what they need to do and they do it, you know. Yeah. Um it reminds me it reminds me a little bit of and Tolkien talks about this and how Sam was kind of inspired by these sorts of figures, but it ma- it makes me think of like the especially early the first few seasons of like Downton Abbey and watching that show and just um 
being really intrigued by the devotion of like the people oh, working like in the, the home, like and the, towards the home yeah. and towards the family, mm-hmm. you know, especially like um, the butler, whatever his name, I can't remember what his name was. What's his name? The big, um, the tall guy. Yeah. Yeah. But, you know, like it's just, that's, that's what he lived for. Mm-hmm. Right? He loved that family. And he like loved it was that his family. Own. Exactly. Yeah. Um, and, and again, like there's something, like that's a, to me, that's like what's, that's what Sam is like, right? Yes. Like he, He's like, this is my, this is my job. This is, this is my lot in life and I'm going to do it with all that I have. Right. Right. I'm going to give myself to it. Frodo is his family. Right. Yeah. Uh, beautiful. Mr. Carson. Yes, that's right. Mr. Carson. Mm-hmm. Um, okay. So, Conies. Um, ah. Conies. So, I've never heard them called Conies before. Yeah. I was, uh, I, I'd never... I mean, I've heard them called... The only context in which I've heard them called Conies is in... Lord of the Rings. Lord of the Rings, yeah. So you mean... Is it a British thing or is it a Middle Earth thing? I don't know. That's so weird. Because I mean, the only Coney I know of is Coney Island. Right. I was kind of thinking, did Coney Island get named Coney Island because a bunch of rabbits lived on it or something? Yeah, I don't know. That's Let's see. Weird. Coney. A rabbit. Heraldry. British. Ah. Uh... That is British. Let's see. Animals, a rabbit, especially the European rabbit. Um, <clears throat> European rabbit. Oh, Aww, it's so cute. Bunnies. Aww. <laughs> very cute. Um, is a species of rabbit native to southwestern Europe and northwest Africa. Um, it. It has been introduced widely elsewhere, often with devastating effects on local biodiversity. Uh, <laughs> um, they are rodents. Yeah, but they're they so rodents. cute. They are cute. Um, let's see. Uh, you know, I guess these, I guess those particular type of rabbits were the inspiration for Watership Down, which is a great book. If oh, y'all haven't read that, so good. Yes. Um. Anyway, uh, you know, basically, I, I don't know. We're not going to do a full. Uh, not gonna deep dive on Coney. Deep dive on the on where the, oh, where the word okay. Coney comes from, but uh, anyway, rabbits. So rabbits. Sam calls them Coney's. Um, Gollum kills a couple of Coney's, brings them to Sam, and says, "Here, you know, here eat these." And then Sam goes to cook them, and Gollum's like, "What Gollum are you doing?" Fit. Oh, I thought that was so funny. Um, let's see, Sam. Uh, Sam gathered a pile of the driest. Let's see. Oh, here we go. Sam set the pans down, and then suddenly... Uh, Gollum set the pans down, and then suddenly saw what Sam was doing. He saw he gave a thin hissing shriek and seemed to be both frightened and angry. Ah! It's... No, he cried. No, silly hobbits. Foolish. Yes, foolish. They mustn't do it. Mustn't do what? Asked Sam in surprise. Not make the nasty red tongues, hissed, hissed Gollum. Fire! Fire! It's dangerous. Yes, it is. It burns. It kills. And it will bring enemies. Yes, it will. And he has a point. He does have a point. It was risky. Mm-hmm. Because, yeah. We'll and later... Fire their smoke. Late, later on, Sam is, like, further away and sees the yeah, fire sees still going. And he's like, oh, yeah. you know, Gollum does have a point. Yep. Um, and Sam says, I don't think so. Don't see why it should. If you don't put wet stuff on it and make, a, make it smother. But if it does, it does. I'm going to risk it anyhow. I'm going to stew these conies. Stew the rabbits? Squealed Gollum in dismay. Spoil beautiful meat? Smeagol saved for you? Poor hungry Smeagol? What for? What for, silly hobbit? They are young. They are tender. They are nice. Eat them. Eat them. No, now, said Sam. Each to his own fashion. Our bread chokes you, and raw coney chokes me. If you give me a coney, the coney's mine, see, to cook if I have a mind. And I have. You needn't watch me. Go and catch another and eat it as you fancy. Somewhere private and out of my sight. Then you won't see the fire, and I shan't see you, and we'll, be, and we'll both be happier. I'll see the fire, don't smoke, if that's any comfort to you. Um, so, you know, they go back and forth a little bit, um, and, and, you know, Sam decides he's going to make a stew, uh, and, um, Gollum has a funny little line of not knowing what, what's, what taters is, oh, and Sam yeah. says, potatoes. Potatoes. Yeah. Cook them, mash them. What is it? Mash them. Mash them, fry them, put them in a stew. Mash them, yeah. fry them, put them in a stew. Um... Yeah, you know, I wanted to say that there are certain things, certain meats or proteins, 
that are completely appropriate to eat raw. Mm-hmm. Right? I mean, you have ceviche, yeah. which is, and you have sushi, raw fish. Well, I guess ceviche is technically fish that's cooked with a little bit of acid, but like steak tartare, that's raw meat. Mm-hmm. But I'm with Sam here. You don't yeah. want to eat these young conies raw. I don't think you want to do a coney tartare. Mm-hmm. You don't have nearly, well, you do have some herbs, but no. I don't know. You don't. I think, wouldn't eat raw rabbit. You don't think fresh raw? I mean, the fresher it is, probably the safer it is, right, to eat raw. Probably, and the more. Wild, I'm not saying I would. But <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I mean, when you eat anything raw, it's a risk. Yeah. So, I think I think, and plus with rabbit being as, um, you know, think how muscular rabbits are. I know. Right. He doesn't have nearly the set of chops that Gollum does. I don't think that. I think it would have been worse than overdone steak. Yeah. As far as its toughness. So, well, good prefer, on Sam. I prefer overdone steak to raw steak. I know you do. That's something we can just agree to disagree about. Okay. Um, yeah, potatoes. Yeah. Too bad they didn't have any. Right. Not the right season. Right. Um, but, uh, you know, it's interesting to think about them going around and finding all the different herbs and just seeing whatever they can find yeah. that's growing kind of in that area to put in the stew. Sounds like they had a pretty good selection. I mean, they talked yeah. about marjorams and parsleys and rosemaries and sage and thyme. And yeah. Like, Dang, that's a, a few bay leaves, yeah. thyme, sage, parsley, sage, rosemary. Don't and even. Thyme. Don't even. Oh, my gosh. I love me some Paul Simon, but, oh, I Even know. some Simon and Garfunkel, but not that song. Are you Stop. going to Scarborough Fair? You know, we just, we just lost like half of our listeners right there. I know. Well done. Shame on you. Um, what's the matter, bro? I just don't like, don't like Simon and Garfunkel. <laughs> <laughs> um, Pardon me. Could you please stop playing Simon and Garfunkel? No. I'm trying to sing it, which is worse. I like most of Simon and Garfunkel's stuff. But yeah. I, yeah, and, and I like... I, I like, like Paul Mrs. Simon. Robinson. I like Paul Simon better. And I like Mrs. Robinson. Well, we all know you like Mrs. Robinson, given your comment about about illegal herbs earlier in that the episode. That was a total joke. I'm just saying. I hope I'm not going to get like arrested. Yeah, it's a good thing we live in Colorado. Which, if anybody knows me, they know like what a ridiculous untruth that was. I'm sure. I'm sure that. Um, all of the government agencies that enforce that kind of thing are just listening, waiting for you to slip up. They're like, oh, they're doing their herbs and stewed rabbit episode right now. <laughs> we'll listen to this one for any herb jokes. Hmm. Hmm. Oh, they live in Colorado? Darn it. <laughs> uh, it's just a matter of time before Tennessee will follow. Yeah, I'm sure. Anyway. Um, I think Tennessee will be one of the last ones to fall. They probably will, actually. Uh, in our history. Yeah. Anyway, what well, were least, we talking about? At least we got whiskey. Tennessee whiskey. We do have whiskey. That's right. And bourbon just north of us. To cover the multitude of sins. Mm-hmm. Whiskey and bourbon. That's right. Well, bourbon in general. Mm-hmm. Anyway, because um, they're the same thing. What? All bourbons are whiskeys, but not all whiskeys are bourbons. Right. Yeah. It's a special kind of whiskey. Bourbon. Mm-hmm. It's the best kind of whiskey. Yes, I agree. Too bad they didn't have any of that to put in their stew. Oh, man. That would have been crazy good. Yeah, that's what they need. They really do. They, they should have brought some, like, wine or... I mean, don't you think, like... You know, red wine would actually probably be perfect. Red wine. Yeah. They should have stolen... Didn't Mary and Pippin have some? You if, think um... that between stopping in Rivendell and then stopping yeah. in La Florian, they would have stocked up on, like, alcohol beverages. But I don't know. Maybe the elves don't drink alcohol. Maybe not. Well, Mary and Pippin have, like... They got the 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 uh, end drought, right? End draft, that's right. Yeah, yeah, and then they got into some good stuff at mm-hmm. at Saruman's place. That's right. So they're getting all the luck. Poor, mm-hmm. poor Frodo and Sam. They're just best they can do is stewed rabbit. Stewed rabbit in water. Yeah. Mm. It's good thing they had herbs. Right. Yeah. All right. So uh, the chapter gets that kind of ramps up the excitement towards the end towards the end of the chapter. Right. Uh, after they have their little meal of uh stewed rabbit they um they're they're hanging out and all of a sudden they uh they see four tall men right two had spears in their hands with broad bright heads two had great bows almost all of their own height and great quivers of long green feathered arrows 
All had swords at their sides and were clad in green and brown of varied hues, as if the better to walk unseen in the glades of Athelion. Green gauntlets covered their heads, covered their hands, and their faces were hooded and masked with green, except for their eyes, which were very keen and bright. At once Frodo thought of Boromir, for these men were like him in stature and bearing, and in their manner of speech. We have not found what we sought, said one, but what have we found? Not orcs. Elves, said a third doubtfully. Nay, not elves, said the fourth, the tallest, and as it appeared, the chief among them. Elves do not walk in Ithilien in these days, and elves are wondrous fair to look upon, or so tis said. Meaning we're not, I take you, said Sam. Thank you kindly, and when you're finished discussing us, perhaps you'll say who you are, and why you can't let two tired travelers rest. I am Faramir, captain of Gondor, he said, but there are no travelers in this land, only the servants of the Dark Tower or of the White. So two towers again there, right? Yep. I think the white tower he refers to is um, Minas Tirith. But we are not, neither, and travelers we are, whatever Captain Faramir might say. Then make haste to declare yourselves and your errands, said Faramir. We have a work to do, and this is no time or place for riddling or parleying. Come, where is the third of your company? The third? Yes, the skulking fellow that we saw with his nose in the pool down yonder. He had an ill-favored look. Some spying breed of orc, I guess, or a creature of theirs. But he gave us the slip by some fox trick. I do not know where he is, said Frodo. He is only a chance companion met upon our road, and I am not answerable for him. If you come on him, spare him. Bring him or send him to us. He is only a wretched gangrel creature, but I have him under my care for a while. But as for us, we are hobbits of the Shire, far to the north and west, beyond many rivers. Frodo, son of Drogo, is my name, and with me is Samwise, son of Hamfast, a worthy hobbit in my service. We have come by long ways, out of Rivendell, or Imladris, as some call it. Here Faramir started and grew intent. Seven companions we had. One we lost at Mar Moria, the others we left at Parth Galen, above Raros. Two of my kin. A dwarf there was, there was also, and an elf, and two men. There were Aragorn, they were Aragorn, and Boromir, who said that he came out of Minas Tirith, a city in the south. Boromir! all the four men exclaimed. Boromir, son of the Lord Denethor, said Faramir, and a strange stern look came upon his face. You came with him? That is news indeed, if it be true. Know, little strangers, that Boromir, son of Denethor, was high warden of the White Tower, and our captain general. Sorely do we miss him. Who are you, then, and what had you to do with him? Be swift, for the sun is climbing. Are the riddling words known to you what that Boromir brought to Rivendell? Frodo replied. Seek for the sword that was broken. And in Bladris it dwells. The words are known indeed, said Faramir in astonishment. It is some token of your truth that you also know them. Aragorn, whom I named, is the bearer of the sword that was broken. And we are the halflings that the rhyme spoke of. That I see, said Faramir thoughtfully. Or I see that it might be so. And what is Isildur's bane? That is hidden. Doubtless it would be clear in time. Um, so Faramir and, uh, and his men... Um, even though they're not entirely sure what the, what the deal is with Frodo and Sam, they're not, they, they're not out to attack them, right? They're not out to arrest, you know, arrest them, at least not yet. Right. 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 And they start to speak of their mission here in, uh, Ithilien. And it basically consists of trying to disrupt all of the men coming up from far south, far in the south, right? Right. So. They're on their way to... Or to Mordor, serve right. to serve the Dark Lord, right? Right, and if you look here on the big map, right? Mm -hmm. So you've got near Harad and South Gondor. Mm -hmm. So basically, they're from down in this area. Okay. Right, coming up. The men are. Yeah, that's right. The red men. The 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 dark men. Dark right, men. the Southrons. Right. Yes. Right. Um, I curse the Southrons, cried uh, said Damrod. "'Tis said that there were dealings of old "'between Gondor and the kingdoms of the Harad "'in the far south, though, they were never, though there was never friendship. "'In those days our bounds were away south "'beyond the mouths of Anduin and Umbar, "'the nearest of their men since any pass "'to or fro between us. Or, "'I'm sorry, the nearest of their realms "'acknowledged our sway. "'But that is long since. "'Tis many lives of men since any pass "'to or fro between us. "'Now of late we have learned "'that the enemy has been among them. And they are gone over to him, or back to him. They were ever ready to do his will, as have so many also in the east. I doubt not that the days of Gondor are numbered, 
and the walls of Minas Tirith are doomed, so great is his strength and malice. But still we, don't, we will not sit idle and let him do all as he would, said Mablung. These cursed Southrons come now marching up the ancient roads to swell the hosts of the Dark Tower, yea, up the very roads that craft of Gondor made. And they go ever more heedlessly, we learn, thinking that the power of their new master is great enough, so that the mere shadow of his hills will protect them. We come to teach them another lesson. Great strength of them was reported to us some days ago, marching north. One of their regiments is due by our reckoning to pass by, sometime ere noon, up on the road above, where it passes through the cloven way. The road may pass, but they shall not, not while Faramir is captain. He leads now in all perilous, advent- perilous ventures, but his life is charmed, or fate spares him for some other end. All right, so they're up here to give the Southrons a hard time, right? right. They're not they're not a large enough force to just completely stop mm-hmm. the Southrons, right. but they are going to give them make it difficult for them to get to Mordor right. and muster with the rest of Sauron's forces. Right. right. And what we see uh, in the next part is uh, a little skirmish, a skirmish between them. So. They ambush them. Mm-hmm. They ambush the men of Sauron of of Southron, and they don't want to give them any part in, do they? Right. They're just like, we want to let them have it. Right. Yeah. Um, it says Frodo says it sounds like a hundred blacksmiths all smithing together. They're as near as I want them now. Uh, Damrod says they are coming. See, some of the Southrons have broken from the trap and are flying down, flying from the road. There they go, our men after them, and the captain leading. Sam, eager to see more, went now and joined the guards. He scrambled a little way up into one of the larger of the bay trees. For a moment he caught a glimpse of swarthy men in red running down the slope some way off with green-clad warriors leaping after them, hewing them down as they fled. Arrows were thick in the air. Then suddenly, straight over the rim of their sheltering bank, a man fell, crashing through the slender trees nearly on top of them. He came to rest in the fern a few feet away, face downward, green arrow feathers sticking from his neck below a golden collar. His scarlet robes were tattered, his corslet of overlapping brazen plates was rent and hewn, his black plates of hair braided with gold were drenched with blood. His brown hand still clutched the hilt of a broken sword. It was Sam's first view of a battle of men against men, and he did not like it much. He was glad that he could not see the dead face. He wondered what the man's name was, and where he came from, and if he was really evil of heart, or what lies or threats had led him on the long march from his home. And if he really, and if he would not really rather have stayed there in peace, all in a flash of thought, which was quickly driven from his mind. So Sam has a good thought here, mm-hmm. right? Sam looks at this man compassionately, you know, this man who's yeah. just died right before him, mm-hmm. and says, you know, and, and I have to think of Tolkien here, going back to World War One, right? And Tolkien there fighting against the Germans in in France, mm. probably seeing his fair share of yeah. of death. It's a good point. And thinking like. These men aren't all that different from me, mm-hmm. right? Or any of the other soldiers yeah. that I fight with, Absolutely. right? I'm sure they'd rather not be here, mm-hmm. too. Yeah. You know. They have families back home they would much rather be with right now. Right. Yeah. Um, that was a, Yeah, I found that part very touching. Yeah. But that's how Sam, you know, that was the first thought that went through his head. It's a good thought. Yeah. It's definitely a good thought yeah. and, uh, you know, shows shows Sam's compassion. Absolutely. Um and, but little does he have time to kind of, you know, indulge that thought. And all of a sudden, uh, where, where, cried Damrod to his companion. May the Valar turn him aside. Mumak, Mumak. To his astonishment and terror and lasting delight, Sam saw a vast shape crash out of the trees and come careening down the slope. Big as a house, much bigger than a house. It looked to him, a gray clad moving hill. Fear and wonder, maybe, enlarged him in the hobbit's eyes. But the Mumak of Harad was indeed a beast of vast bulk. And the like of him does not walk now in Middle Earth. His kin that lives still in latter days are but memories of his girth and majesty. It's almost like a, a mammoth or something, you know. Yeah, no, I was trying to figure it out. Yeah. Um, the big as a house thing kind of threw me off. Right. But I guess um, to Sam, being small as he is, it would look right quite large. Yeah, and it just keeps on going um, on the great beast thundered, plundering and or blundering and blind wrath through pool and thicket. Arrows skipped and snapped harmlessly about the triple hide of his flanks. Men of both sides fled before him, but many he overtook and crushed to the ground. Soon he was lost to view, still trumpeting and stamping far away. What became of him, Sam never heard. Whether he escaped to roam the wild for a time until he perished far from his home, or was trapped in some deep pit, or whether he raged on until he plunged in the great river and was swallowed up. 
An Oliphant it was, he said. So there are Oliphants, and I have seen one. What a life. But no one at home will ever believe me. Well, if that's over, I'll have a bit of sleep. And Mobilong says, Sleep while you may, but the captain will return if he is unhurt. And when he comes, he will. De- he, we, we shall depart swiftly. We shall be pursued as soon as news of our deeds deed reaches the enemy, and that will not be long. Go quietly when you must, said Sam. No need to disturb my sleep. I was walking all night. Mobilung laughed. I do not think the captain will leave you here, Master Samwise, he said. But you shall see. So, end of the chapter. Uh, any final thoughts on that chapter, Greta? I'm just glad that Sam finally got to see his holy fonts. I know. You know? Yeah. He's earned it. He definitely has, coming this far. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. High time, high time that boy saw an oliphant. Yeah. You know? Yeah, I totally agree. Right. Uh, there would be no pardon if he had not seen one. None. No pardoning. None. The fate of not seeing it. Yeah. It was, uh, I was very happy for Sam. Yeah. He was like, he, he, he uh, he got a, several, he had a few, some really good things happened to him in that chapter, between the stewed rabbits and... His vision of Frodo and then the Oliphants. So mm-hmm. I mean, think like he's, uh, he must feel pretty encouraged. Yeah. At this point. I'd say so. Yeah. I'd say yeah. so. All right. All right. Haiku time. Speaking of being encouraged, this song always puts me in a good mood. Good mood for haiku. You know it. Are you going first or me? I'll go first. Okay. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17 syllables and haiku. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17 syllables and haiku. Nice. Yeah. Well done. All right. Rock, Alrighty, Rudy. Rock, paper, scissors. All right. Rock, rock paper, paper, scissors, scissors shoot. shoot. Oh, I man. win. I'll go first. Okay. All right. Here's my haiku. Hold on. Oh, where did it go? Oh, there it is. Okay. A chance meeting. Men guard their homeland and hobbits, now with full bellies. Nice. Mm -hmm. Good stuff. Thanks. You look like you're pretty proud of that one. Yeah, I kind of liked it. You know, it came pretty quickly. And usually my ones that come quickly, I'm usually pretty proud of. If I don't Mm -hmm. have to think about it too hard, I, I don't mess it up too bad. Yeah. Yeah. So. Cool. Yeah. How about yours? Under the red eye, Gondor glimpsed. Still in danger, yet reason to hope. Oh. I like it. Yeah. Yeah. I don't think it's as good as mine, but it's, yeah, it's pretty not. good. Yeah, it's pretty good. What else we got? We got a couple from Mary Grace. Mary Grace. I'll read our first one and you can read our second one. Okay. What's taters, precious? Potatoes. Served by Sam. You can't say no to that. (laughs) Nice. And then kind of a little note to that haiku. Mary Grace says, While the quote, boil boil them, mash them, stick them in a stew, does not appear in the book, it was a funny idea on Jackson's part. Yeah, I think think that was a good addition. If you're going to make any additions, you know. Yeah. I like what he did there. Me too. Um, Bigger than a house. Oliphant. Warlike. And yet a majestic being. Mm. Very nice. Nice indeed. Good. Well done, Mary stuff. Grace. Good Thank stuff. you. Always well done. We have a couple from Amanda. All right. Um, it's funny, both Amanda and um, Mary Grace sent in two haikus and one of each one of them what am I trying to say? They both sent in two haikus, and they both wrote one about potatoes and mm-hmm. one about olifants. I think they might be kindred spirits. That's right. That's right. <laughs> right well, those, those are kind of the highlights. Yeah, there's a couple of big highlights in the chapter. Yeah, definitely. That's true. Yeah. Um, okay, here's Amanda's first haiku. Innocence of Sam. Faceless enemy has face. Olifants disrupt. Nice. Yeah. I like it. Awesome. Very good. Ah. Right. Here's her second one. Potatoes. Boil them, mash them, put them in a stew. Gollum likes them raw. Nice. <laughs> nice. Ew, raw potatoes. That might be just as bad as raw rabbit. Yeah. Yeah. Good job. I don't know. I don't think raw potatoes would be quite as bad as... Have eating. you ever had a raw potato? No, but I think just if I had to eat one of them raw, I would probably pick the potato. Well, yeah. I guess I probably would, too. You know, raw vegetables, I mean... 
Yeah. Yeah, I guess that's true. But it's not like it's, it's, not like it's gonna make to you eaten. sick. It's not like it's gonna make if you, you eat sick. If you eat a green potato, that could make you sick. Okay. That's such a thing. It was actually it was such a thing. Uh, that was potato poisoning mm. back in the day. Because if you see a potato with the greens, oh, here's here's my little um, public safety message. Okay. If you see a green, if you see any green on a potato, whether it's a chip or a fry or a mm-hmm. raw potato, don't eat it. Cut it out. Throw it away. Whatever. Because it means that a certain um, there's a high concentration of a particular um, substance. I forget what it is. That this means it's an old potato. And this particular, um, I think it's a naturally occurring element, but because the potato's been sitting around too long, you, there's a higher concentration of it in the potato. So that was a long, that you. was a long public safety. That was a long public safety. So I'm here sorry. comes, we, so we're going to bring in Mr. T to, to sum it up for you. Okay. <laughs> I pay you to fool to eat green potatoes. <laughs> I should have just said that to start with. Thank you, John. Uh, and then G.I. Joe will come in and say, don't eat green potatoes, kids. And now you know. And knowing is half the battle. Yes. G.I. Joe. Yes. G.I. Mm-hmm. Joe. Good stuff. All right. So don't eat green potatoes, mm-hmm. but do enjoy Amanda's haikus because they're right. awesome. Right on. All right. And then we have a couple from Superfan Josh. Superfan. Superfan. They're annotated. Ah, yes. Which we always appreciate. So here's Josh's first haiku. The Southron ride north over mountains and plains. Gondor fears invaders. And he says, for my first haiku, I realized after that I played a bit with the idea that the Gondorians dislike uninvited travelers, while also being mindful of the Haradrim forces massing at Mordor. Gondorians, they don't like unwanted visitors. Let me read that. Hold on. Okay. Uh, The Southron ride north over mountains and plains. Gondor fears invaders. Um... I played with the idea that the Gondorians dislike uninvited travelers while also being mindful of the Haradrim forces massing at Mordor. Ah. You understand it now? Yes. Okay. Good. Very nice. Yeah, always. Haiku good. dose. Mumakil carry the Southron far and like Hannibal, frighten all. Oh, Hannibal. Nice. nice. I like that nice. reference. As for the second, there are two things to note. Number one, Mumakil is the plural of Mumak. I had to look this up on TolkienGateway.net. Good. Whatever, yes. Josh. Please. We know you knew it. You're just trying. You're just trying to bring us down to your level. It's okay. Mm-hmm. Uh, number two, the image in my head of the Mumakil, not that the films don't do a good job, brought to mind the Carthaginian warlord Hannibal mm-hmm. as he crossed the Alps to attack the Romans. Yep. Here, my BA in classical studies is showing. Into 64 BC. That's right. Wait, was that no? That was the first Punic War. The second Punic War was when Hannibal. That was sometime in 200 get, BC. Get your Punic Wars straight. I know. I just studied them with there's the boys no, on uh, there's yesterday. There's no pardon for mixing up your Punic Wars. You're right. There is... No, but yeah. So the first Punic War was fought by Hannibal's dad. The second one was Hannibal and his elephants. Uh, that, that was a disaster, was it not? Like, not many people survived. And not and a lot of elephants died, too. Crossing the Alps. I, I, I can't remember. Yes, they did. I was there to see it, but it's been a long time. <laughs> Spoiler alert, the Romans won. Oh. Yeah. Although Hannibal did, and his elephants did put up a good fight. And his olifants. Huh? And his olifants. And his olifants. And I think I misspoke early, earlier. I was just trying to say that Josh wasn't trying to bring us down to his level. He was trying to bring himself down to our level. That's what I was trying to say. Don't bring me down, Josh. <laughs> <laughs> I thought it was, you know, he may have very well had to look that up, but I'm not buying it. Yeah. I think you probably knew that. But, uh-huh. but now we all know it thanks to him. So thanks, Josh. Yes, thank you, Josh. Always enjoy your haiku. I yes. enjoy everybody's haiku. They're all so good. Mm-hmm. All right. Uh, so I think we're done. Are we? Except yeah, I, I got to play done. this song now. Of course you do. Uh-huh. Josh. <laughs> no, that's not what I was trying to say. 
Josh wasn't bringing us down. I know, down. I know. It just he made was me bringing think of that song. us down. No, he was... I know, I'm just Jeez, I'm playing the song. I'm confusing myself. It's a great song. I know. It's one of those, like, you know, you think you like you think of, like, writing that song and recording it, and it's like, I bet that was a fun song to record. I'm sure it was. You know? Because it's like, you know, oh, we can't forget to roll our tongues on Bruce! 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 Yep. All right. All right. Uh, corresponding more correspondence? Yeah, that's this it. This time? This that's time around? That's it. That was kind of, right. kind of a light week. Yeah. Well, we had, you know, all those iTunes folks to catch up on. We did, so, so that worked out well. Yes, it did. Yeah. Uh, we are going to be off next week for uh, the Easter Easter weekend. So, um, next episode will be book four, chapter five, um, and we need haiku by, survey says, April, um, April 19th, April 19th, so, um, and the next episode will follow somewhere shortly thereafter, thereafter. so, yeah, yeah. I think that's a wrap, Johnny. All right, that's a wrap. Thanks for listening, guys. Uh, Thanks again to our patrons, uh, executive producer William Hutton. Dr. Hutton. Dr. Hutton, uh, as well as Shannon Stockbridge, Josh Sosa, Brian Orr, Margaret Lyon, Emilio Perea, Zeke Farmer, Caleb Santana, James Applegate, Douglas Underhill, and Caitlin Fascista. You guys rock steady. That's right. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You guys don't bring us down. Not at all. You bring us up. None of you all. Yeah, you take us high enough. Definitely high enough. Well, uh, yeah, you do. Take You take us high enough and then some. There you go. That's right. All right. All right. Uh, okay. Yeah. Bye. <laughs> I think we're done. <laughs> Thanks for I'm listening, I was trying to think y'all. if there's any other witty thing I could say there towards the end. But I think we're... Uh, With the, wit- our, the wittiness is run dry. Our brains have been, have been uh, spent. So. All right. Yeah. Very well. Time to go eat some herbs and stew rabbit. All right. You got it. All right. Thanks, guys. Bye, everybody. Bye, y'all. Please remember to check out truemyths.org and tolkienroad.com for show notes and plenty of other Tolkien goodness. Also, if you're enjoying the podcast, would you please leave the Tolkien Road a rating and feedback on iTunes? It's a great way to support the show and takes less than a minute. On our next episode, we'll continue our journey through The Lord of the Rings with Book 4, Chapter 5, The Window on the West. Please send haiku or other correspondence to Tolkien Road Podcast at gmail.com. Thanks for listening, and until next time, the road goes ever on.